so <clears throat> the slides are available. You can download them and uh, reference them. Uh, I have them on SlideShare. So if you just go to the tinyurl.com slash rethink SF, those are just my initials, uh, go there and um, you can grab the slides. Uh, if people are interested in the speaker's notes, I'm happy to share them. Just let me know after and um, you can have the full access to the, um, to the content. But I like using SlideShare to just give me some baseline analytics of who's looking at the content. So the topic today um, comes uh, greatly from two past presentations I've given over the last year. I've modified it, I've modified it a little bit for um, our coronavirus world that we're in now. But I think most of the messages are still pretty solid. Um, the first time I gave the presentation was actually for UX India in Hyderabad uh, last year. Uh, it seems like so long ago, but it wasn't even a full year. It's just crazy how, how time has been flying in our new COVID existence. And then I presented another version of this in France at a, at a conference called Blend Web Mix. So I want to, um, oh, Prasanna, I remember you. Um, Thank you so much. So many of you will, who have seen these before will see some common themes, but I, but I encourage you to stay on and to listen to these themes in light of the new normal that we're currently in, because I was speaking about them as new opportunities. Now I think we need to speak about them as this is the new normal and it's not going to change. Um, so a little bit about myself, just so people know, my name is Steve. Uh, I work at Google now. I, I, I don't speak for Google. Um, I teach at UC Berkeley. I don't speak for Berkeley. Um, and um, I've worked at a number of companies in the past, as you can see on the, on the slide. I, I love to work and I love to teach. So those are the two things that I try to always be doing. Um, I want to emphasize that my primary background is one as a person who works in tech. So I've worked in all United States um, based organizations, even though much of the work I have done is international. My frame of reference comes from a technology, US, mostly enterprise, large company perspective. So please keep that in mind. Um, I don't pretend to know everything about the world or startups or smaller businesses um, or other types of organizations other than the ones that I've worked in. So I, I, pretend, I don't pretend to be an expert in any of these things. Um, I think for us in terms of rethinking, my main message is we need to rethink our focus and we need to think about why are we existing as a UX community. And I've got a few vignettes. Um, I think Prasanna will remember some of them and anybody else who's seen this presentation before. But I want to start here. Um, this is a picture of um, the volcano in Honolulu, uh, the capital of Hawaii. And I don't know if you all can remember all the way back to 2008 in 18, but back in 2018, the United States and Korea were engaged. Um, and when I say Korea, I mean North Korea, not South Korea. Um, were engaged in quite a few Twitter battles um, with the president of the United States saying some pretty bold statements and with the North Korean uh, leaders also saying some pretty bold statements. So tensions were heightened back then. Um, in fact, two months prior to the story I'm about to share, there was messaging from North Korea that messages, oh, sorry, that missiles would be tested to prove that they would be able to reach Hawaii. And around this context, there was a message in January that residents of Hawaii received on their mobile devices. And the mobile device said, the, the message said this, um, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii, seek immediate shelter, this is not a drill. So just put yourself in that context. Um, I'm sure for many of you, um, I know about heightened tensions um, in India and around the world, you can probably imagine that this is a really stressful situation. And when you see that there's a missile um, likely coming to your to your place, uh, it's, it's extremely unnerving. And it wasn't until almost 28, 30 minutes later that they, they announced an official alert rescinding that threat. So half an hour later, people who had received this message that a missile was coming in was, were told, nope, sorry, false alarm, our mistake. 
So initial reports came out saying that this was a user interface error, saying that the operator of the system who um, reportedly had access to an interface that looks like this, basically picked the incorrect link in order to communicate. And there's a link down here, it says drill paycom state only. And it's for the Pacific command. And basically they're just issuing an alert that this is a drill. And in reality, the, um, the, the link that was clicked was the one underneath this test message link. So it says Paycom state only. That means Pacific command. It's a message that goes out to the entire state of Hawaii. So that was the link. And the thing I like to highlight here is that it's interesting to see that the link right above it says test message. So if you are an operator in high stress, even if you know that this is um, a, only a drill, if you see the word test, then it's highly likely that you'll probably um, press the link near the word test. So there's some really easy interface problems here that we could solve for. But in reality, um, messages that said that this was the problem were incorrect and further analysis indicated that actually the problem was a procedural one. Um, the operator who was later interviewed basically said that he was led to believe that it was not a drill. And the, um, I don't know what they call it, the person in charge of the exercise was supposed to say a series of phrases that let everybody know that it's a drill. Um, one of those phrases is you need to say exercise, exercise, exercise three times in order for everybody in the, um, in the room to know that you're about to do a drill. Um, so this operator didn't hear that. You're also supposed to say, um, you know, this is a drill or this is not a drill. And apparently the person who announced this drill said, this is not a drill. And so in hearing that the operator correctly in his mind pressed the this is not a drill. Let's make everybody aware that there are missiles coming in. Um, and as a result, kind of chaos ensued. And here's a, an image that was taken from, from Hawaii uh, showing the signs on the, on the highway. Um, again, 30 minutes later, letting people know that it wasn't a threat. So I think this is a really important message for us to rethink what we mean when we say user experience. I think so many of us are um, are indexed on the UI. I think many of us are indexed on the end user, uh, but we have to remember that user experience is all about the, um, the design of a system and the design of the procedures and the policies and the interactions that people have and all of the challenges that are associated with making sure that every piece works correctly together. So here's another example, and this isn't as, um, it's not as uh, terrifying. Um, Microsoft back in the, um, in the 1990s was trying to introduce Windows 3 uh, to their users. I don't know those of us who are old enough to remember the Windows 3 interface. It was, a win it was one of the first windowed interfaces to the mass market. Apple had been using it for a while. Um, and Microsoft was responding to problems that users were having in terms of understanding how to use this uh, windowed environment, which actually in many cases required knowledge of what happens on the command line. And so they created this uh, UI that was basically an overlay. And the idea was that there was a series of, of wizards that users would have to use in order to do the basic functionality. And there's a little icon there of a dog and the dog's basically asking you what you want to do. And the only thing that Microsoft got from this was just notoriety as creating one of the worst products ever for software. And um, again, it's not as terrifying as a missile, uh, but Microsoft spent a lot of money on this. And um, because it was not sufficiently researched and effectively designed, it was not effective in the marketplace. And even Steve, ba Steve Ballmer, a uh, former um, executive at Microsoft said, you know, there's nothing we've undertaken with a couple exceptions like Bob, where we've decided that we have not succeeded and let's stop. And so when you really fail to consider the actual user needs and the things that our, um, the people using our systems need to be effective and successful, 
we can have we can have great failures. And then the final example, and I like this one just because it, it, it it's based on an appeal to stereotypes, is the the Bic pen. So many of you probably use pens. Um, I have an example of one here, not a fancy one. I got this from a hotel um, many years ago. Um, pens are pens, right? They're writing utensils. You you use them to to jot things down on paper, and um, Bic thought that it was a smart idea to create a version of a pen that would be expressly for women. And, and in fact, they said, it's in my notes here, they said, yes, this was this pen would always be the perfect accessory which you can see on this image here. And the, the real thing they did was they just changed the color palette. It was basically a pen, but the color palettes were stereotypically colors that people assumed were representative of, of what women wanted, what women and girls wanted and needed. And um, Bic discontinued um, the product shortly after it was being released in 2016. So the reason why I wanted to start with these three examples is that we need to rethink us, we need to rethink our focus to figure out what's the full user experience, not just the presenting problem, but the entire user experience. What's the whole system? And this, the image here is from a blog post um, from Kat Holmes. She's a former uh, leader of user experience here at Google. And she's also now a senior vice president of design at Salesforce. And she talks about when we design and research around stereotypes and what we believe to be true, we forget the bigger message. And so that's really my call today. We have to remember that user experience focuses on having a deep understanding of users, what they need, what they value, their abilities, and also their limitations. I think this is a really great reminder that when we think we know what we're trying to design or research for, we may not necessarily be um, doing justice to, to our work as user experience practitioners. Um, some of the good news is that the fundamentals in user experience have changed, and I think this allows us to rethink the direction where we're going with user experience. Um, back in the uh, back in the earlier 1900s, um, Thomas Watson Jr. Uh, inherited his father's business at IBM, and he decided he was going to use design to distinguish IBM uh, from other competitors. And he came up with this well-cited quote: "Good design is good business." And I think it's not, I think that was a great marketing pitch that IBM had in the, um, in the mid 1900s, but it wasn't until more recently that organizations have really started to understand the value and the role of design. Um, Catherine Courage, uh, VP for uh, user experience at Google said, companies realize they need to attract and retain loyal users. People don't stick around, uh, won't stick around and use a poorly designed site or app and McKinsey, uh, the consulting firm, came up with what they call the McKinsey Design Index. So they look at kind of four sets of design practices, and they found that these, pra these practices correlate strongly with higher revenues and returns. So the practices include analytical leadership, so having people actually measure and drive design performance. They look at cross-functional talent, so basically making sure that anybody in any silo has an obligation and an expectation that they are responsible for design. Um, there's this notion of continuous iteration. So constantly listening and gathering feedback from customers and users, and then testing and iterating to figure out what works and what doesn't work. And then making user experience owned by everybody. So breaking down walls, whether it be physical, digital, um, or service focused, so that there's not a siloed approach to user experience, but rather a global approach to user experience. And in the design index, the authors basically say that many of the key drivers of the strong and consistent design environment identified in their research call for company level decisions. So if this is not happening top down, um, you still might be able to do good things in your organization, but it requires top down focus for an organization to truly be design driven and design led. And I think this has given rise to real strong leadership expectations. So we're starting to see more UX leaders be hired in organizations. We're seeing roles like the chief design officer. I wouldn't be surprised if there would be a chief user experience officer someday. Um, but because of the expectation that design leads to success, 
I think we're starting to see that permeate in the C-level and uh, in executive organizations. As a result, many companies and organizations have been starting to pitch that now is a great time to get started in design. And I realize many of these numbers have changed due to coronavirus and the pandemic, but I have a feeling that we're going to see these trends return. Um, there was an old trend where companies had lots and lots of engineers, lots and lots of people who were developing code and creating the uh, infrastructure required for product experiences to exist. But now we're starting to see more designers, more people in user experience um, be hired. So the ratios of engineers to design are, are starting to, you know, have been continuously dropping. Again, I realize we're in a kind of an unprecedented time right now, but I think as we move forward, um, companies are going to regain um, and perhaps even get a bigger understanding of the importance of user experience because of the experiences that people have today. Uh, again, Catherine Courage says, these days an established design team is as standard as a product management or engineering team. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's a truism in our organization. Um, Dylan Fields, co-founder of Figma, said, to hire good designers, founders have to battle over them. It's only going to get worse as companies continue to ramp up their design hiring goals. And up right up until COVID, right up until you know, late March, um, even out here in the Bay Area where I am, um, we were seeing really, really tough times to find good designers, good researchers, good UX engineers, good UX writers, because companies were battling and companies are throwing money at people. Companies are throwing fancy titles at people to try to get the best talent possible. So we're definitely experiencing challenges in the UX community in terms of getting good people. Um, I think part of this is because expectations are evolving. Like what good UX means in the past was, oh, I need to hire a designer. But now it's what kind of designer? Is this a user experience designer? Somebody who's focusing on interactions? Somebody who's focusing on visual? Somebody who's focusing just on the UI? Um, are we looking at the information architecture, the content? Are we looking at metrics and um, the architecture as a, um, as a system? What are we actually looking at from a perspective of user experience impact. Uh, Envision basically published, more and more companies are recognizing how broad, deep, and multifaceted UX design really is. And I think this um, helps us emphasize that UX requires a team. I love this, um, there's a article, a video by Jacob Nielsen where the, he talks about the UX unicorn myth. Right. There's this notion that there's this magical individual and they can do everything related to UX. Well, first of all, UX is a team sport. So it's not the responsibility of one person. It's the responsibility of the entire team, regardless of what your role is. And also UX is really, really diverse. So you can't be a great writer, a great designer, a great interaction designer, a great researcher, a great analyst. Um, all at the same time. You might have all those skills, and I think that's awesome. I think having people with deep stacks of skills are really important. But if you think about just developing code, there's a reason why we have quality engineers while we also have developers. You can practice your craft really well, um, but you can't practice multiple crafts really well at the same time. And for many of us, we're probably familiar with things like pair programming. You're probably familiar with things like developers who then have their code tested. Um, you can focus on one thing, but you can't focus on all the things. So UX really requires a team. Uh, Nielsen says UX constitutes many different specialties. Forcing one person to do it all is a prescription for medi mediocrity. And I think many companies have demonstrated that. And so as we rethink where UX is going post COVID, I think this gives us a really interesting set of opportunities for the skills uh, that we look for in our, in our team compositions. Um, despite COVID, uh, job expansion was continuing. I think we will resume this trend. Uh, when we were looking at jobs in the, even earlier this year, we were seeing the, the demand outstrip the supply in terms of what UX um, had to offer. And uh, Nielsen has predicted that the profession will grow exponentially um, over the next few decades. So again, I think as we're trying to figure out what are the implications for the new normal, um, you know, there are some things for us to reconcile and to understand, but realistically, 
I think the idea that UX is critical for company success is here to stay. And I think we're going to continue to see supply shortages from the pipeline of skilled UXers. So I think this is a great opportunity for all of us on this call and everybody that we work with, everybody that we mentor, everybody that we are growing to think about how can we make a better impact with the limited resources we have. There's also a growth of understanding the context and the meaning of experience beyond technology. Um, one part of this is that metrics need meaning. A lot of companies in the past have looked at this idea that there's some magic number. Net Promoter Score was one of the big ones over the past few years that people have said, oh yeah, what's the likelihood of, of a customer to recommend my product or my service to somebody else? But the reality is that without meaning, without context, numbers are just numbers and they don't really tell us the full picture. And when you add the notion that people are actually people, um, emotions matter. And I would argue, argue that um, um, emotions ultimately lead to our values. They ultimately say, if I'm happy about something or if I find something that gives me pleasure, it's consistent with my value structure internally. So this is um, Aaron Walter's hierarchy of user needs from his, um, his book, Designing for Emotion. I really love this model. And I think if you follow emotions to the bitter end, you understand that the core values that drive us are really key for, for, our, um, for our design goals. There's also this rise of the importance of empathy. Design thinking is one area where we see this quite a bit. Um, building empathy and an understanding for our users, for our the people involved in the ecosystems we're creating, help all of us on the team better understand what's driving people. And um, instead of having disconnected answers from metrics, it's better to just have the big picture of what's going on. And I think this is a this is a, a GIF that I created just from a YouTube video. Um, if you can get an understanding of what it's like to be in the mind or in the life of your users, right, of the people who are using and part of your systems, it's worth a thousand words. So you might have a metric that says, oh, this user is frustrated or this user is not being successful at completing their task. But if you're able to show a video, if you're able to show a vignette, tell a story, that can often have a lot more power than um, a disembodied number. So I think all of us have the challenge of figuring out how do I build empathy truly effectively across my organization? Um, there's great approaches to this in terms of things like understanding the full journey. I think the, the notion of journey mapping and experience mapping and, and elements of service design are still relatively new in parts of our, um, of our companies. And we need to embrace that user experience is about more than just um, one thing at one time for one user and it's more about a full community of people who are trying to accomplish goals over time and here's some you know examples that we have from adaptive path also from a, a colleague of mine in terms of how do we start looking at the more soft elements of user experience how do we track things like emotion um, over the user journey how do we look at a user's value structure as governing the expectations that, that they have from our products and our services. Um, and because of these changes, I think it's given rise to a bunch of internal struggles for user experience ownership. Uh, it's kind of like a multi-way tug of war. Basically what we're seeing is there are different individuals within different organizations, within similar organizations, who are basically saying, we own UX. And so this idea of ownership has really come to the fore in many organizations that I've worked in. Um, you see that we have many data sources that includes people. So qualitative data is equally critical to quantitative data, but you might have data like financial information. You might have usage logs showing you how customers are using your products. You might have survey data or market research coming in. All of these data are valuable, but I think it's almost human nature in some companies where people try to own it. And they probably, they try to say, I represent the, the voice of the user or the user experience. And I think that's a bit of a misnomer. Um, we all need to have collaborative ownership. And this is, this is an image from the, pro, the parable about the blind men and the elephant, where there's a group of blind men and they're all touching different parts of the elephant. One person touches the trunk and thinks, oh, I'm 
you know, I'm touching, I forgot what all of the things were that they're touching, um, but one individual thinks they're touching a tree, another individual thinks they're touching um, rubber, another individual thinks they're touching a horsetail because of the hair. And without a full understanding of the entire picture, there's really no way for us to effectively know how to move forward with the true full user experience. Ray Kroc, founder of McDonald's, is famous for saying none of us is as good as all of us. And I think that's a really important clarion call for us in user experience. So think about how can we as an entire community come together for the user experience of our products. Um, on the research side, we're seeing a rise of the importance of mixed methods. So basically, not just having a qualitative researcher, a quantitative researcher, a market researcher, or a data scientist doing logs analysis and modeling. It's really more the marrying of all those signals together to figure out what does that tell us and how can we make better decisions as we move forward. So I think thinking about how we can collaborate as a team on the research and the design side will help us get faster to our futures. Um, and then another aspect is this idea of conventional notions of user experience. Uh, job roles are changing. This is an article from Fast Company a few years ago where they talked with uh, leaders in user experience and they found that there's a number of jobs that are predicted to go away. And some of these jobs um, are things like design research or visual design or even UX design as a role. And what they're trying to make is they're making the case that the design community has basically been a little bit too vague about what it means when we talk about design or even user experience. And there's going to be a need for us to start really specializing and narrowing down on the specific skills um, that our companies need. If we believe and agree with the idea that user experience requires collaboration, then we need to make sure that we can articulate what those specific needs and expectations are that we have as an organization. That'll also help, um, I think, academic institutions better prepare uh, individuals for these careers. There's going to be a, no a host of new opportunities and responsibilities. Some of these we're starting to already see right now, but things like um, considering artificial intelligence as a design material. So what does it mean to design with AI the same way it means to design, for example, with textiles? What does that look like? How do we even think about that? Um, I love this idea of the post-industrial designer, not only designing for the specific product or service that you represent, but also designing for all of the interconnected devices and designing for APIs and designing for SDKs to figure out how do I design so that the creators and makers um, of our tools can, be, um, to, can, can pre create better systems moving forward. And then finally, the rise of, of futures thinking and strategy. Um, as COVID has demonstrated, we're in a time that's extremely uncertain, volatile, complex, and am ambiguous. Um, this is referred to often as VUCA. Um, the systems we're in are very complex, and so we need to figure out how do we remain agile, agile in order to um, deal with disruption. And I think there's a need for us to really start focusing on the role of insights and foundations instead of just getting direct answers. Uh, we have to keep in mind that research, for example, um, in user experience, a lot of that's tied to things like usability testing. And Erica Hall reminds us that, you know, usability testing has a goal of identifying specific problems in order to fix them. But many organizations are trying to find researchers to not do usability testing, but to provide insights to help the company figure out what to build next. We need to remember that some of the basics like usability testing still need to be um, addressed in order for companies to effectively move forward. Similarly, there's these, uh, we're seeing a rise in design systems over local solutions. So instead of having designers and other people in the design trade solve patterns, just establishing what the basic patterns are and then anybody can apply them. And here's a couple examples from Google Material and from Salesforce Lightning Design System. And the thing I like about these design systems is that many of the ones that are, that are strong emphasize the role of values and priorities in addition to the role of patterns and guidelines. So as we move forward, I think it's good to um, remind ourselves that it's a really amazing time to be a designer. Um, but as a result of many of these um, converging uh, themes, we're starting to see the world 
look very predictable. And because of design systems, because of common approaches to research, we're starting to see almost like a monoculture evolve in design. If you look at a lot of your favorite apps and your favorite um, uh, sites, you'll probably see a very similar familiarity with them. And I think that's great because it makes them more predictable and we can move forward. Uh, we can move forward faster, but it also makes things more challenging in terms of really shaking things up and trying out new experiments. Um, John Maida reminds us that, you know, great art makes us wonder um, and great design makes things clear. So if I'm designing an enterprise tool to help somebody accomplish a task, I think having predictable design that works the way I hope it works is really smart. But if I'm trying to shake up the way people think and promote creativity and innovation, I need to think about what are some rules that are worth breaking in order to help shake people out of their comfort zones. Um, teamwork and diversity is another, is another area where we're seeing a lot of um, growth and development. Uh, and there's a lot of research now showing that the more diverse teams get, the more intelligent and the more ROI companies um, see from them. And so I think that's a really important point to think about as we consider figuring out what UX looks like in the future. Uh, and then finally, um, there's this notion that brilliant jerks really should not be invited to the table. It's better because we are such a collaborative environment and we require those deep skills and specialties. It's important for us to understand um, what the cost is when we bring on a brilliant person who's not able to work with others. So as a community, I think we need to start focusing on how do we really emphasize the team nature of user experience. So this is my final section. Um, I want to emphasize that we need to rethink our future. I think we need to think about where we're going as a UX profession. And I think much of it comes down to understanding users' values. So we need to start by saying, do I know what my users value? And if your answer is no, you need to take a step back and say, regardless of whether or not I'm designing an app or a service, if I don't design it with, an, with a mindset of capturing what my user holds dear, then I'm missing a key part of the process. And once we do understand our users values, we can then move toward understanding what is the code? What are the ethics principles that we should make sure that we always adhere to as we are um, coming together as a community to build out the user experience? Uh, Dorothy Shamansky has this interesting idea of developing ethics codes based on what we've learned in architecture. And there's actually a proposed design, uh, sorry, proposed architecture code for living buildings, which encompass things like accessibility, safety, beauty and security. And I think this is a great first step for us to consider as a UX field, how would we create a code that looks like um, these aspects? And so I, I, because I work at Google and I work within, I've worked within design and design thinking for a while, I've got a bunch of how, how might we's here. How might we develop principal design systems that defend our users? How do we embody the values and ethics that our users um, need? in order to ensure that we're actually um, working effectively. And then how might we fully inform users and implement strategies to educate our users about trade-offs that they need to make? Um, these are examples from Apple and from Google on their uh, well-being initiatives to help users see how much they're using their technology and whether or not it's being allocated the way that they, that they want. Uh, we need to understand the full impact of our design. Uh, we're designing so many devices that have adverse impacts to the environment, be it devices that are held in our hands with pieces of plastic that we then throw away after a period of time, or maybe it's devices like the technologies we're using right now that are based on cloud-based in infrastructures, which require significant air conditioning in data centers that most of us probably don't see day to day. So what does the full impact look like? And there's a, is there a way for us to reduce that? Um, how might we extend design thinking and empathy toward human values that guide our organizations? Um, so how do we think about the actual orientation that our organization has to promote values um, from our customers, of our customers? 
And, and how might we um, encourage design and research toward affirming our humanity and our connectedness? And I think this is really critical right now in the time of COVID because we're in a time when we aren't really connected to each other except through these screens that we're currently, um, we're currently dealing with. Um, I already talked about sustainability, so I'll skip that one. The last one that I think is really critical just from an education perspective is addressing the skills gap. Um, and I think this is really important now um, with coronavirus to think about. Um, think about the shortage of experienced professionals we recently had in terms of UX with the demand of, of experienced UXers outstripping the supply. What can we do now, given coronavirus, that allows us to um, address this gap? And how do we think about preparing the next generation of designers so that it is a collaborative effort, not just amongst the schools where we're expecting schools to kind of pump out uh, skilled designers and UX practitioners, but we actually share the responsibility from the industry side. And so how might we explore ways of working to share talent where needed? Maybe there's this idea where we have a person as an apprentice come into one company and then they go to another company to learn a new skill and we share them as a group of organizations. And how do we anticipate on upcoming skills gaps to address user experience for the new normal? We don't really know what the world is going to look like post COVID, but I have a feeling it's going to kind of look like this. I think we're in it. So how do we build our community like this and so and i didn't put this in here to um you know have a an applause line for rethinking ux but i do think that the work that you folks are doing with this type of initiative is really um, laudable because you're trying to say what are the implications that we can start focusing on right now in order to rethink our future given that we are living in the new normal um, and then the final part is how might we consider futures the future needs and scenarios that we have as a team. How can we get people to think about the consequences of their work while they're researching and designing it now? How do we make it easier to think futures and uh, to think about strategy um, for everybody? To recap, um, I encourage you all to think about an action that you can take, hopefully you can take today to rethink UX. How can you guide your organizations toward understanding their values, the values of your, of your users? How can you affirm humanity and connectedness with your work? How can you prioritize sustainability and defend your users and partner to anticipate skills, gra uh, skills gaps and ultimately promote uh, team-based stra strategic and future thinking? And so thank you so much for, um, for listening through all that. I really appreciate it. Sorry for the, the lecture format. Um, and hopefully, hopefully the audio was able to um, survive during this entire time but more than happy to, to take questions or to have any future conversation.